Do you have limits to what you would show on the screen? I absolutely do. Yeah. I, I won't show stupidity, lack of imagination, disrespect for the audience, <laughs> something that somebody else has already done better. In terms no, of, of uh, brutal know. violence, uh, you've done some of the most memorable violent scenes in horror films. I, you know, I think I have tended not to do that kind of thing uh, again and again. I think mm -hmm. the first two movies I made, certainly The Last House the most, and then Hills of Ice also. But after that, uh, got a little bit more abstract. But um, I think that it's valid to make those movies in, in your early career. And uh, I, I don't think there's ever a reason to be uh, merciful towards your audience. <laughs> you know, I mean, they want you to grab them by the throat and, and keep them there for an hour and a half or, or whatever. But you're always following your own inner guidelines. I mean, there are no rules for making these films. There's no laws among ourselves, you know, as fellow genre filmmakers, horror filmmakers. One guy will make a film that somebody else might look at and say, that's, that's really, uh, not, that's despicable. Yeah, you know? absolutely, uh, I've seen. And I have a hard time watching some horror films, you know, the, the, the hostile uh, genre. Gornography or torture <laughs> porn. <laughs> yeah, torture yeah. porn. I just have a hard time with it. But I, I must say, I forced myself to see hostile, uh, and uh, I remember, saying, I just don't want to watch people being tortured, but the film didn't just do that. It had some very interesting character things, yeah. and some great action things. And a good director, a good storyteller will not just do that. And I think if somebody just does, does that, then then they are doing it some sort of a violence porn or whatever. And I think a good horror director is talking about, you know, the primal fears and, and uh, if you want to be honest about talking about those things, you have to get down to the nitty gritty about fear and things people do to each other. Last House, I think, was the universality of family and protect, trying to protect your family. Hills of Eyes was, it was a middle of nowhere film. And also another family genre. film. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, all, I, uh, many of my films are family. But uh, that, the idea, as I realized one, one day, uh, we live in the middle of nowhere. Why, that's why there's so many films about the middle of nowhere. It's like we live on this tiny little blue planet and more and more scientists are telling us, no, it's a trillion light years to the nearest object. And, we're out in the middle of nowhere, you know? We are out in the wilderness of space. So the, the naive family that gets off the main road, you know, goes out in the middle of, what do you know, what are you gonna find out there? Do you feel like society is protecting us? You take the society away from them and you get the family of the hills have eyes. Yeah, I, I, I think that there is this sort of, uh, social contract, if you will, uh, that we all agree not to kill each other. <laughs> yeah. You know, that it's a kind of a bad thing. Some people don't, aren't able to control that. But most of us realize that violence doesn't pay off uh, uh, to the group. And so we, we sit on it and we learn to control it and we become civilized. But uh, there's always those cases where it, it vanishes or you find yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, you never know what's gonna happen. I mean. Look at what happened in New Orleans, you know, in, in, in a couple nights. It was put back into the Stone Age in a way, you know. The whole infrastructure just stripped away and roving bands of people with guns. It's like, it doesn't take much. Yeah, there's know, not much of a vanish. fence around us. No, the, the veneer is much thinner than we like to think. Well, with A Nightmare on Elm Street, you really touched a nerve. So where did that idea come from? I think it was a combination of a, a com uh, hearing somebody talking about uh, having a dream that was, seemed so real that they could almost pull the person out of it, and constructing a character that was in some ways thought about very viscerally, in some ways thought about very intellectually. The intellectual part was, what, what is the, one of the earliest things I can think of as a weapon that would have terrified human beings? It would be pre-spear, pre-knife, pre-sharpened stone to the claws that nature gives to its predators. Hmm. The cave bear reaching around the corner with this massive mitt with daggers on the end of every finger, that's primal. You know, that's what we were running from for a million years or however long it was, you know. And uh, the man himself was based on a man who frightened me as a, as a, as a child, woke me from my sleep uh, one night shambling down the sidewalk uh, in Cleveland. And uh, I got out of bed to see what, what it was and I looked and there was this, guy dressed very much like I made Freddy dress like. Really? Um, I think he was just a random drunk going down the sidewalk, but he had an uncanny ability somehow 
to realize this little kid was looking down on him from the second story apartment window and he just stopped and then he just looked right up at me. And, like that, you know? <laughs> and I fell back and, and sat on the edge of the bed in the dark and my whole family was you know, asleep and counted to, I don't know what, uh, a thousand, you know, something I thought would, he, he certainly will go, but I haven't heard him go, but he must, he must have gone, he can't be waiting. And I went back to the window and he was waiting and he just, <laughs> like that, and then he turned wow. and he walked down the sidewalk looking at me and he walked around the corner and I, that's where the entrance to our building is. <laughs> Ran to the front door to our, of our apartment, and I heard the door, the street door to the street open, and I just, uh, I went and pounded on my brother's door. He was ten years older than I was, and I said, "There's a guy. He's coming for me." And my brother literally went down with a baseball bat, and wow. the guy ran away. But the essence of that man was that he enjoyed terrifying a child and enjoyed sort of destroying the, the comfort of innocence. So, that's that became Freddie. And then, you know, intellectual again, a mask. I want a mask. Everybody's using masks, but I want them to be able to talk. What about a scar tissue? And that led into the, the fact that parents had burned him alive, and that's why he was in the other world. Even the colors were, were out of Scientific American. I read an article on the two most difficult colors for the iris or the retina to see next to each other were those two colors. So, really? Yeah, so it was just, you know, it was a... It was kind of just a smart, smart hodgepodge of, of stuff, and then finding an actor who was brilliant and who could bring it to life. And one of the key things about his appearance is that makeup, despite all the applications of proth prosthetics and the like, you see Robert Englund beneath it. Mm -hmm. And it's not Jason Voorhees, it's not Michael Myers. It's a mask of scar tissue, but this is a human face. Yes, and it's a cogent, articulate, devious, clever, resourceful villain. It's not like just supernatural that he shows up someplace. Freddy figured it out, you know, and he kind of knew where you slept. And that kind of villain, I think, is always more frightening than this. So he's just really, really smart. Well, dreams and nightmares are so potent anyway. I mean, uh, they are our original movies. So the yeah. first movies we see are our dreams, right? Yes. I, I think it was one of the most uh, universal films I've made. What must it have felt like? What did it feel like to walk into a, a Halloween shop and see Freddy gloves and masks and hats and all of that? Not only would you see it in shops, would you on Halloween you <laughs> see little kids walking around in Freddy costumes. It was really quite, quite remarkable. Yeah, it's a strange feeling. I mean, you know, he sort of, look, you know, on those dark nights when you think, I just don't have it, and I'm you know, fake or whatever. So said, no, well, I created something that's known around the world. That's not bad. And then the next Halloween success story, <laughs> The Scream Face. I mean, you did Scream, and it changed the course of horror films once again. They became self-reflective and, and self-referential and usually not nearly as intelligently uh, as you did. Right off the bat, let's credit Kevin Williams, and that was his script. Great script. And it was a fantastic script. Very, Originally called very, very Scary very Movie, right? Yes, very funny. And we thought uh, when they when Bob Weinstein wanted to call it Scream, we thought, well, that's a stupid title. I'll never, <laughs> never do well with that. But uh, it was kind of like when I made New Nightmare and thought of the idea of doing a, a film about those who had made the film. And uh, of Freddy, because no more stories were being told about him, somehow being freed mm -hmm. to actually prey on us in, in real life. That seemed like a breakthrough, and you were kind of talking about a film while you're making the film. All right. And... Scream just took it to the next step, and I felt like, wow, this is great. And, and Kevin was smart enough to make it not about the filmmakers and the actors, but <laughs> about the audience, <laughs> right. you know, much more appealing. Yeah. So, and I thought he did it so cleverly, and it was a mystery that, you, you know, the audience couldn't figure out, the fact that there were two killers, and I just found I could pour myself into it really nicely, and I think I brought a certain amount to it, too, and, you know, um, it, it was a great marriage of a, of a really, really gifted writer and a director, I think, at the top of his game. Your characters are often very believable, very real-world contemporary young people. Why do you think you connect so well with an adolescent or a young audience? Probably because I never grew up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the horror audience is great because, you know, they have the, the expendable income to, to spend on movies and they have the time and they don't have to pay for babysitters. And so they, they are, you know, given the economics of, of film increasingly, they're the ones that are more likely to be in theaters. But, you know, there's something about a teenager that is quite profound because they are on that, they're on that tipping point between childhood and adulthood. And they're going through those, all those huge changes of, 
I'm not a child, I'm an adult, but oh my God, look at this adult world. It's totally screwed up and it's dangerous. And, and my parents are like, they're more like children because they don't mm -hmm. get it. And there's sex to deal with. And uh, you know, what am I gonna do for a career while I find the one of my, the love of my life? I mean, there's tremendously profound things going on during the teen years. So they are kind of like a, a boiled down version of, of the human journey. And I think if you understand the journey, then you understand teenagers and you can write about them. Do you think becoming a father uh, changed your perspective as, a, as an artist or filmmaker? Well, I, yeah, I think um, having kids keeps you, I mean, everybody says it keeps you young, but it actually wears you down to a nub. But, <laughs> you know, it, it, you're around their culture. And so you, you're in on their conversations, you're in on their music, they're, you're, you're privy to all of that over the spectrum of, you know, from the time of kids to the, well through the teens at least. So that helps a lot, you know, you're not removed from it. I think if you were a childless uh, writer, you, you'd have to work harder to, to, to figure out that culture in a way because it's, it's not brought into your home on a daily basis. So I think that did help. I think it's important to listen to kids, you know, um, Marilyn Manson was once asked, oh, if you had a chance to speak to a, to a typical kid, kid of your audience, what, what would you tell them? And he said, I wouldn't tell them anything. I'd ask them what they wanted to tell me. And that's, that's the brilliant way of looking at it is, you know, just learn from them and, and keep your ideas young and just, you have to work at, at not staying young. I mean, you've got to get old, you've got to get wrinkled, you've got to get frail, whatever, but young in the sense of continually reappraising your ideas of what's what and, and staying open to the world as it develops because it's an ongoing and quickly changing, as you know, thing. And if you just kind of sit back and rest on your laurels or, or what you learned when you were 20, you'll become obsolete. And so that's one thing I've, I've never tried to learn the lingo of kids or anything like that, but I've tried to stay open to the world as much as I can, and I think that that makes a difference.